Long years ago, long years ago, went out in sin, went out in sin. I had no hope, I had no hope, no peace within, no peace within. Down on my knees, down on my knees in agony, in agony. I prayed to Jesus and he gladly set me free. I never shall, I never shall forget the day when all the burdens from my soul were rolled away. Side, he's by my side. My feeble steps. My feeble steps. He comes to God. He comes to God. When trials come. When trials come. He comforts me. He comforts me. Through faith in Him or sin, I have the victory. I never shall. I never shall. Forget the day. Forget the day when all the burdens from my soul were rolled away. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I think I actually was able to say that to like literally everybody in the room. It's good to have you with us. I uh, hope you're having a blessed weekend. The Lord really met with us yesterday, gave us a wonderful opportunity uh, to honor uh, Mrs. Hardison and uh, to, Lord willing, be an encouragement and a help uh, to the Hardison family. We're really thankful for what God continues to do uh, here in our church family and in our lives. Looking forward to what the Lord has for us this morning as uh, Brother John uh, brings forth the uh, Sunday School lesson. I was thinking about how pertinent uh, the things that we're seeing in Isaiah are in our everyday life. And it really is remarkable more and more and more how clearly uh, important it is that we trust God at his word, that we not um, look at the word of God as if it were I mean, I think we'll see it a little bit again this morning. I'm beginning to really understand the, the fact that the living cornerstone is important. That Christ isn't just a, an example set for us long ago, but that he's the living cornerstone and we are the living stones in the building and that he is literally working in our hearts and lives today. So I hope that's an encouragement to you. Uh, we're going to go to the Lord now in prayer and then I'm just going to turn it right over uh, to John, and uh, he will uh, teach us Sunday school. Let's pray. Father, thank you very much for your love to us. And Lord, I ask you that you would uh, bless now. We come before you. Lord, we have, uh, for the next few hours, probably, I guess probably three hours between now and the end of the morning services, Lord, I ask you that you would bless all of the conversations, all of the prayer, singing, special music, preaching, teaching, all of the interactions of all of your children. Lord, if there are those that come to be with us today who are um, not your children, whether they be members of the church or not, if they're not your children, Lord, may today be the day that they are born again. May they truly be set free from religion. Lord, the, the quote-unquote Christian religion is not what you're after. Lord, you want for each and every one of those on the entire planet to know you. This is life eternal. They might know thee, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And Lord, we ask you that you'd help us as a church family, as a body, as your body, You'd help us. That not only you'd help us, that you'd work it in us. Quite honestly, Lord, you're not helping us. We're simply either surrendering together to you, submitting to you, or, or we're working in our own strength. Lord, we don't want to work in our own strength. So help us, bless us, meet us, cause us to be the people you'd have us to be. We want you to get all the honor, all the Thank you for everything you're doing. Praise you in Jesus' name. John, you got it, sir. 
Amen. Good morning. We'll be back in Isaiah, and today we'll be looking at um, chapter 28, so you can turn there, Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, the uh, title of today's lesson is Judgment and Blessing Part 2. We saw the contrast between those two in chapter 27, we'll see it again in chapter 28, and really we see it throughout the book, don't we? Uh, throughout the book of Isaiah, these vivid contrasts, these, this really clear-cut choice that we all have to make. You know, which, which, one, which one do you want? We know which one God wants to give us, but um, some reject his blessing, some reject his grace, some reject his gospel, and uh, stay under the judgment that, that they're entitled to, that they deserve, that they, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Which one do you want? Which one do you have? And uh, before we get started today, let's uh, ask God's blessing upon our lesson. Father, we thank you that um, your word tells it exactly like it is, uh, very clearly, very simply. We thank you for the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity that is in Christ, you're not asking us to jump higher today than we jumped yesterday uh, with religious effort. You're just asking us to trust in you. You're just asking us to trust your word and your son. You're just asking us to believe your gospel. And that's all you're asking of the Israelites from day one. That's all you're asking from anybody on the planet anywhere, Jew or Gentile today. Lord, help me to trust you more today, not to jump higher than I did yesterday, but to trust you more today than I did yesterday. Help us all to grow as pastor is, Lord, you put on his heart edification. And Lord, we all need to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 28, judgment and blessing. All right, here's a simple outline for the chapter future judgment of the northern kingdom, future blessing of the believing remnant, no matter what kingdom, no matter where they're, where they're from, uh, and then future judgment of the southern kingdom. They lasted longer than the northern kingdom. The light shined brighter in the south for a longer period of time, but it went out, and uh, the fall of the northern kingdom should have been a wake-up call to the southern, and for some it was. There were some believers. That's why we, called, we refer to the remnant. Isaiah was part of the remnant. But judgment was coming for both the north and the south. Remember, Israel is broken into these two uh, groups at this point in time, divided kingdom. And then the future judgment of the whole earth, which is really what this section of Isaiah majors on. Sometimes it zooms in to specific areas, but uh, it reminds us in every chapter that um, it, this is not just about Israel. This is not just about one location. This is about the world. And uh, we can have blessing or we will have judgment. Um, now, even in the last two sections of where it's primarily talking about judgment, there's some reminders of blessing. There's some reminders of God's invitation of grace. There's a reminder that you don't have to be judged in those last two sections as well. So we'll see that constant contrast throughout. All right, let's begin with verse 1. Woe to the crown of pride. To the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is as a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. Ephraim was the prominent tribe. Therefore, Ephraim is a nickname sometimes used to describe the entire northern kingdom. Other times it's referred to as the kingdom of Israel whereas the south is referred to as the kingdom of Judah. Um, it's interesting, in Samaria, it talks about this, uh, this crown, it talks about these valleys and so forth. There was a, a mountain range that was kind of shaped like a crown, so Isaiah is probably borrowing some of that imagery. But it's not, a, it's not flattering what's said about them in verse 1. Now, I want you to compare, sometimes it's interesting to compare the beginning of a chapter or the beginning of a book and the end of the chapter, the end of the book. So go to the last verse, Isaiah 28, 29. And let's see a, a, quite a contrast. This also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts, 
which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. Left to ourselves, we're more like the crowd described in verse 1, aren't we? I mean, just left all to ourselves. But as new creatures in Christ with access to God, we can be more godly, we can be more conformed into the image of Christ and reflect more of the, the one who's spoken of in the last verse of this chapter. We can be more like him. We can remind others uh, not so much of fallen Adam, but of the risen Christ in our lives. We can be more like him, new creatures. And not only we can be, but if, you, if we are new creatures, we should be. And, and you, we should be growing in that grace and knowledge, edified, as we've been learning about, uh, built up in our faith in him. Uh, if, we're, if we're his body, we should be holding to the head and functioning as a body and getting stronger spiritually, not trusting in our strength, but stronger spiritually because we're connected to him, his strength. But I want you to notice here, Ephraim, the northern kingdom, there's some descriptive terms that um, are used here, the drunkards of Ephraim uh, and those who are overcome with wine. Now, alcohol may not be your specific vice. It is for some people, it's not for others. But I want to tell you something. Although there are strong warnings in this chapter about alcohol abuse and, and being a drunkard and, and all of that, there are strong warnings. And the Bible is clear uh, that that's not good for us. That's not really the first sin mentioned even in this verse, let alone the chapter, right? Here we go. The crown of pride. Why were they drunken? <laughs> See, there's a root underneath that. Woe to the crown of pride. You might not struggle with alcohol. Maybe you'll say, you know what, I've just never, never gotten into that. Don't. <laughs> if you never have, don't start. Not a good thing to get into. Drugs and alcohol, things like that. Not a good thing. Not good things. Uh, you may never have struggled with those kinds of things, but everybody... I would say as an absolute, everybody in measure, some way more than others, some way less, but everybody in measure will struggle with having at times a heart of pride. Uh, and we need God to help us. That's why God uh, tells us. He tells born-again believers. He warns born-again believers about pride and about the need for humility. Most people will struggle with this from time to time, and pride leads to other problems, other sins. This is a sin. Pride is a foundational root sin that leads to other bad fruit, that leads to other sin. It, there's some examples mentioned in this chapter. Drunkenness is just one of them. But I was thinking about it um, not long ago, thinking about how pride and selfishness always go together. But what I'm, what I'm learning, too, is that there's one more thing. It's, I used to think of them as kind of a, two sides of the same coin, and, and that is true. But there's one more thing you're going to find with pride. Uh, you're going to find if, if you're giving in to pride in your life, yes, there's selfishness. That'll be there. But there will also be a measure of unbelief, even in the life of a Christian. You say, well, Christians are not unbelievers. Yeah, but uh, watch, watch the Jews. Watch the remnant even. Watch the disciples from time to time as they struggled in their faith. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Is that a contradiction? No, it's a great prayer. Uh, it can be true of, of a born-again believer. Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. So pride, selfishness, and unbelief, they go together. And so it's not just a, a two-sided coin, it's a three-fold cord, a negative three-fold cord, but God can break it. They're not easily broken, but God can break that, uh, that, us from that bondage. I want you to notice in verse 1, the crown. The crown was never appropriate for Ephraim. Never. On many different levels, we could talk about why it wasn't. Never. But uh, the crown is not only inappropriate for Ephraim, it was never appropriate for any of us. The Lord is the one and the only one who's worthy of his crown. Now, let's read on. Judgment of the northern kingdom, verse 2. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which is as a tempest of hail, and as a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The crown of pride, there it is again, the drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden under feet. Assyria had already started to hammer away at the northern kingdom at this time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the capital of the northern kingdom was Samaria. They were about to be overrun by the Assyrians. 
This should have been a strong, I mean, did you think about it on the map, you think about, okay, the northern kingdom, way up here, Samaria, kind of over here, southern kingdom. The enemy's getting closer to the southern kingdom. That should have been a warning to uh, the folks that Isaiah primarily ministered to, which was the, the king, uh, kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom. Should have been a strong warning to them. I think it was to some. I think some of them heeded the warning. Um, the northern kingdom had enjoyed some periods of prosperity, uh, but they became prideful. Uh, they were off track, really, from day one. They were off track, but they, they increased in their pride and worship of false gods. And uh, the Lord will remove the prosperity of any nation that rejects him. And that is a warning. That was a warning in Isaiah's day, not just to the north and the south, but that's a warning in our day to right here at home. The Lord will remove the prosperity of any nation that rejects him. When you have a crutch, you tend to lean on it. Even if you don't really need that crutch, uh, like you think, you tend to lean on it anyway. You tend to trust in it. And it can, uh, it can do more harm than good by leaning on the crutch. Um, the deceitfulness of riches is a crutch that many are still trusting in today. And it's going to let them down. And the northern kingdom fell and the southern kingdom followed. Verse 5. In that day shall the Lord... Now, we, notice we've changed here. We've cha what the focus of the Holy Spirit now wants to put in front of us. He was just talking about judgment. Now he's talking about blessing. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory. See the contrast? For a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people and for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. Notice the contrast. There's a crown of pride that's... Uh, attributed to Ephraim in verse 1 and verse 3. But did you notice in verse 5, the crown of glory, the diadem of beauty attributed to God, the King of kings. He's the only one worthy of the throne. Only one. Only one. Yet he does delegate, doesn't he? he, he even though he's King of kings, he's worthy of his throne. He's the only one worthy of the crown. He does delegate things, doesn't he? To, to mankind and to government. And that's why we're to respect uh, government, even if we don't agree with them, even if we need to pray for their salvation, we still need to respect um, their position. And this is a good passage for us to be reminded of in our day and age. So I want to turn there. I'll only be there for a second, but go to Romans 13. Romans 13. And I'm just going to read this passage. Not much explanation needed. It's very clear. Romans 13.1 talking about what God delegates, and, and he puts people, and by the way, this is what it's talking about in Isaiah uh, 28.6 as well, right? It's talking about delegated authority and so forth, um, where he talks about people sitting at the gate and so forth. So if you look at uh, Romans 13.1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, those who are in authority. It says, for there is no power but of God. The powers that are ordained are are the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. And you break the law. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister, this, you know, this person who's in charge, the person who's providing security, uh, to, the, to the area, the police force, and the, and the government, and the leaders. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this, ca for, for this cause pay ye tribute also. Taxes. <laughs> and remember, Rome was in power at that time. And uh, we weren't very confident that they did a great job with their finances and all of that. Yeah, but uh, they, they still need to pay those who are providing the security. And, and we, they needed to pay taxes, and so do we. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Let's go back to Isaiah. Uh, that's uh, a good reminder for us in our day and age. I want you to notice again... <clears throat> Isaiah 28, 6, 
We talked about God on the throne, crown of glory, diadem of beauty. But notice here now he's delegated to people. He will in the future delegate. He'll give people responsibilities in the millennial kingdom. Even though he's the one clearly reigning, he's the one establishing all the laws, he'll give delegated responsibility uh, to others to carry things out. For a spirit of, spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, and for strength of them that turn the battle to the gate. Judgment, as in wisdom, strength, as in ability, these are imparted now to the believer from the Lord. And uh, leadership, those in leadership can um, point to the God of wisdom and power as their source of these things. They shouldn't point to themselves. They should give the glory of God, uh, glory to God, just like Daniel did. Daniel and Joseph, what do they have in common? They both found themselves in pagan nations. They both found themselves for a period of time in servitude, kind of a captivity situation, and then both of them rose, both of them, to second in power in the nation, in that pagan nation. And both of them didn't think anything of themselves when they rose to that power. They gave all the glory to God, and they witnessed to the king and to others. And they said, no, no, it, it's God, not us. It's the grace of God in our lives, and you need the grace of God too. So this is a future blessing of the believing remnants being talked about here, both Jew and Gentile, when Christ returns and when Christ reigns. Look at verse 7. We're back now on to judgment. In verses 1 through 4, we had the judgment of the northern kingdom. Now beginning in verse 7, he's switching to judgment that's coming for the southern kingdom. <clears throat> but they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet, those offices were held. They weren't held very well in the southern kingdom, but they were still held. That's where the temple was. Uh, the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. <clears throat> they are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. That's a... Isn't that a vivid description of the results of drunkenness? I mean, those of you that maybe have struggled with that or you know people who have, maybe come from a family uh, where people have, uh, boy, that's vivid. That's really vivid of uh, what that, uh, that people think they're having a fun time. Well, they should see uh, the fruit of that. <laughs> not, not really fun. So we have strong warnings about drunkenness. But drunkenness was not, just like in the northern kingdom, drunkenness was not the root problem. Drunkenness is more of a symptom of the problem. Drunkenness is more of the fruit here, not the root. It's terrible, bad fruit, uh, but the root in the southern kingdom was the same as the root in the northern kingdom. Pride, selfishness, and unbelief. The three most um, satanic uh, things that we can have in our heart. Pride, selfishness, and unbelief. And the priests and the prophets were caught up in this, right? Those who, have been, who should have known the truth and known the truth well, those who should have been giving the truth to others and pointing others to God were leading others astray and they themselves not entering in. Now, verse 9. <clears throat> whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Israel should have had <clears throat> spiritual life uh, as, as a rule. It, Isaiah shouldn't have been an exception in his day. It shouldn't have been just a remnant. There should have been a majority of believers in the nation. They had had the truth for so long. And by the way, not only should they have had a majority of believers, they should have had a majority of mature believers. Believers growing and the church today in America, boy, isn't there a parallel? I mean, <clears throat> should you go in, in most churches today, even good Bible-believing churches, and sometimes you wonder if the majority are new creatures. But you definitely wonder and question whether or not the majority are, are growing, are being edified. You definitely, you know, and I'll tell you, God does the edifying, but we need to, we need to sign up for it. We need to raise our hands for it. We need to say, Lord... I'm hungry, feed me. I want to grow. Israel should have had spiritual life. Israel should have had spiritual growth, and they had neither. But where there is spiritual life, there will be spiritual growth. We don't, physically, we don't live on milk, you know, forever. I know that I have a teenage son. 
Uh, he drinks milk, but he eats a lot of other stuff, you know. <clears throat> Just, I could show you my grocery bill. We were talking about, we, we figured out how much per year, and it was kind of scary. Whoa! <laughs> and then we divided it by three people in the house, and I said, I don't think this is even thirds the way this is. I think one of us is probably, <laughs> you know, doing more than their share, doing, doing more than their part in, in this. So anyway, that's just an aside. But yeah, we don't, uh, it'd be great. I mean, I remember when he was young, you take him to a restaurant like Red Lobster, which we'd save up for five years so we could go one time, you know. And he, when he was young, he'd get a grilled cheese. He had no clue. No hot dog, he had no idea of a lobster and all that. Now it, the secret's out. We go there. We're breaking the bank. <laughs> Every 10 years we have to go now. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm getting way off track. Um, <clears throat> we don't live off milk. Now, you do need milk. You do need milk, but you also need meat, don't you? Now, if we go for a moment to Hebrews, right? Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5. Where there is spiritual life, where, where it really is, is present, where, where there really is spiritual life, you know what else there really is? will be, there will be evidence of that life. And one of the evidences of spiritual life will be a spiritual appetite. And I'm gonna tell you right now, if you eat, you'll grow, <laughs> you will. Uh, but boy, if you're not even hungry, that's really, that really calls into question whether or not you have the life. Yeah. And, and that, by the way, in the, in the greater context of Hebrews 5, that's, that's the warning here. But if you go to Hebrews 5.12, Hebrews 5.12, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, should be some growth, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Should be beyond that now. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Where there is life, there ought to be growth. Go back. Amen. Go back to Isaiah. And he's talking about that right here in verse 9, isn't he? And he's going to kind of continue on that. Israel didn't have much spiritual growth because they didn't have much spiritual life as a rule. Many did not know the Lord as a rule. And, and what a shame for a nation that had the truth as long as they did. And what a shame for a nation like ours. Gospel saturated. It ought to be different. It, ought, it should have been different for them. It should be different for us. Notice a very familiar verse that we, um, that we don't understand the context of. So, so look at verse 10. <clears throat> for precept... Now, this is in the context, folks, of a rebuke. Okay, For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. You know, we often refer to this verse as a good teaching method. And, and it is that. It is a, I mean, that's how you learn, right? What one thing laid upon another, that's how you build anything. And that's how you grow, right? We don't, you know, I, I, when, uh, when I talk to my son about a big task that he's intimidated by, I always tell him, because eating, he can relate to eating. So I... We were talking about earlier. I say, how do you eat an elephant? This is a, a chief in the Navy told me this. How do you eat an elephant if you would want to? How do you do that? At, well, that's a big, you know, that's a big entree, the elephant. How do you eat an elephant? The answer is one bite at a time, right? One bite at a time. Take you a long time. So precept upon precept, that is a good teaching method. However, we need to remember in its original context, it was spoken as part of a rebuke. Israel should have grown to spiritual maturity, and they did not, and they had not. Now notice verse 11, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Instead, they weren't listening. When he came to them the first time, he's going to come to them a different way, speak to them a different way. They'll get it. When the Assyrians come and later on the Babylonians come with their foreign language and carry and drag them into captivity, that's that stammering tongue. They'll get the message then. They'll hear... Verse 12, to whom he said, this is the rest. This is what God wanted for them, right? This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. And I think I have a slide for this. Um, so we're reading, yeah, and let's read verse 13. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. 
Notice this, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. That's really the context of that verse that we quote so much. Now, again, it is a good teaching method. It is appropriate that we would apply it that way, but understand references in their original context, and you'll, you'll get so much more. you get what God wanted us to get out of it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so they would not receive the word of God as it was being given to them simply and clearly, precept upon precept. It was being given to them very clearly, very graciously. They said no. So God's going to speak to them a different way through his chastening hand, through these people through a stammering tongue, through these people from a foreign land. He's going to speak to them through chastening. When God speaks to us the first time, that's really the time to listen. First time. Amen. All right, moving on. Verse 14. <clears throat> Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, uh, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. See, you can tell very clearly he's, he's referring, talked about the priests and the prophets. Uh, he's, in Jerusalem, he's, he's now turned his attention to the southern kingdom. Verse 15, because ye have said, uh, <clears throat> this was their attitude, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. You know, we'll be okay. For we have, made our, we have made lies our refuge, and uh, under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Yeah, so they, now notice this again. Once again, we see it, don't we? Pride, ye scornful men. Uh-oh, we just lost, just lost the keynote. I might have pressed the red button there. Okay, <laughs> you don't, I won't press that again. Uh, pride, ye scornful men. Unbelief, it shall not come unto us. God's saying all this. God's warned us again and again. We'll be all right. We're not going to believe what he said. It won't come to us. We won't be judged. And yet, even to people like that, pride and unbelief, I want you to notice God's grace and God's mercy right in the very context of judgment when he gives us this. Verse 16, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. In other words, you won't have to run from the judgment. Because why? Because you've run to the rock. You've run to the Savior who took your judgment. You don't have to make haste. You don't have to run away. Uh, but just doing things your own way and thinking it's all going to work out in the end, that's very dangerous. And that's what they were doing when it talks about their covenant with death and their agreement with hell and trying to work things out their own way. And they had made leagues with uh, e Egypt. And they said, well, God said we should run to him and he'll be our strength. We're going to run to Egypt and, and Pharaoh will be our strength against the Assyrians, Babylonians. And that, that didn't work. Pharaoh wasn't really uh, a great friend of Israel for most of their history anyway. Uh, that did not work out very well for them at all. We deserve judgment. We can have grace. Right here in the context of judgment, God gives verse 16, that precious cornerstone, Christ himself, the rock of our salvation. As we've seen recently, in, uh, in the morning services, or evening, I can't remember which, but the pastor's been uh, bringing us to this passage. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, unbelievers, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same, the same is made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. 1 Peter 2, 6 through 8. <clears throat> now, I want you to, as we read on, and we look at the next two verses, we're going to do another New Testament comparison. If you look at verse 17, Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. I, uh, I always, well, I, when I first learned about the cornerstone, I recognize that, you know, it's part of the foundation. And, and really all I thought about it was, I knew it was a picture of Christ, a type of Christ, and a, a very powerful picture of Christ. But all I really understood about it was, okay, it's the first stone laid, and it's part of the foundation. And then you kind of move on from the cornerstone, and you talk about other things, but you don't ever move on from the cornerstone. You don't ever move on from the foundation. In fact, it talks here about the line and the plummet, those of you that have worked in any kind of construction or carpentry, you know about a plumb line. 
and you know about the lines that you tap on the ground and there's a chalk line you can follow. And as Pastor brought out, and I never realized this, if this was a cornerstone back here, they would measure the line and make sure everything was square throughout the entire building process based on what? The cornerstone. How do we make sure our church is where it needs to be? We'll all just collectively have a strong opinion, the majority rules? No, we'll be holding to the cornerstone. We'll measure everything against what he says, and we can't be wrong because he's never wrong. So, interesting, this language here in verse 17 about the lion and the plummet. But remember, they weren't having it. They were rejecting their Messiah. They were rejecting the one who would have been the rock of their salvation. And so they were choosing judgment. And it says in the middle of verse 7, And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies that they were trusting in, and the water shall overflow the hiding place that they were trusting in. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. And this is the, con we're still talking about that stone, but it's the stone that they rejected. And I want you to notice the choice in the New Testament. Jesus saith unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the quarter. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now notice this. This is the choice. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. That's what we need to do. That's talking about a good breaking. That's talking about humility. But on whomsoever it shall fall, judgment, it will grind them to powder. That's what Isaiah is talking about in Isaiah 28. It's a good cross-reference to uh, put in your margin there, Matthew 21. All right, we need to move on. Judgment of the southern kingdom. Verse 19. From the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you. For morning by morning shall it pass over, by day and by night. And it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. For the bed is shorter than a man can stretch himself on it, and the covering narrower than he can wrap himself in it. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount... Rezem, he shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. This section of Isaiah, as I've, as I've mentioned, um, uh, it talks about, ultimately, we'll see in verse 22, you see the last two words in verse 22, or last three, the whole earth. Um, and that's really the judgment will fall not just in Israel, but on the whole earth. The camera zooms out and reminds us this is a section talking about the whole planet, but it also zooms in to focus on individual areas on the planet. Uh, though, and what we see in verse 9, going back to verse 19, um, what we see is that those who thought they could bypass God's judgment, they, they're not even going to be able to handle the announcement that it's coming, that it's getting closer, right? The, uh, it's a vexation to understand the report, verse 19. And where this man is in a bed that's too small for him and covers too short for him, there's no rest. There's going to be no sufficient earthly covering. It's an analogy. And in 21, where we find that, uh, this is where we learn, you've probably heard the expression that judgment is God's strange work. This is where we learn that, his strange work, his unusual work. It's not the work that he wants to carry out, really. It says in Ezekiel that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he wants the wicked to repent. God would much rather save than judge. Judgment is God's strange work. Yeah. Amen? Now, how much rather that, he would receive, that we would receive his grace than his judgment? Right. Now we move on to the last section of this chapter. We've been zeroing in, kind of zoom in on the northern kingdom, zoom in on the southern kingdom. The camera comes out again to the whole earth. And it's like we can't just throw stones at the unbelieving Israelites. We've got to begin at our house. We've got to look in our hearts. And say, Lord, I need this grace. Boy, they were a mess, weren't they? Yep, and so are we. We need the grace of God just like they did. So let's read on. We'll just finish out the chapter. Verses 22 through 29. Now therefore, be ye not mockers, lest your bands be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption, even determined upon the whole earth. Give ye ear and hear my voice. Hearken and hear my speech. Now he's going to give... A kind of a parable here. And he's going to compare himself 
uh, God's going to pair himself uh, and contrast himself against a, a wise and a caring farmer and how that farmer carries out his uh, responsibilities and so forth uh, in the context of judgment still, okay? which is interesting. Verse 24, Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? Doth he open and break the clods of his ground? In other words, uh, doesn't he have a, a method to what he's doing? There's, there's, there's definitely a, a reason, a purpose, a method. Verse 25, when he hath made plain the face thereof, doth he not cast abroad the fitches, and scatter the cumin, and cast in the principal wheat, and the appointed barley, and, and rye in their place? Now, all of this would have been very familiar in Isaiah's day. They were a farming and fishing community. They'd say, yeah, we know, we know exactly how that's done. Verse 26, for his God doth instruct him to discretion, and doth teach him. For the fitches are not threshed with a threshing instrument, <clears throat> neither is a cartwheel turned a uh, about upon the cumin, but the fitches are beaten out with a staff and the cumin with a rod. There's a process. There's a purpose behind it. There's a reason why it's done the way it's done. Bread corn is bruised because he will not ever be threshing it, nor break it with the wheel of his cart, nor bruise it with his horsemen. <clears throat> this also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. Amen. So what do we see here? In the context of judgment, God compares himself to a wise and caring farmer who does what is right. Who are we to question God? You know, if I went to, I don't know, I'm from the city. If I went to a farm, I'd say, I'm sure they're doing it right. I have no clue how they're supposed to do this. I, I, I would not question that farmer. He's getting it done. And God, everything that God, how much more everything that God does has great purpose and is done correctly. This reminds us that God always applies the right amount of pressure for every situation. Remember, we're in the context of judgment. So in conviction of sin, in the chastening, uh, in judgment, God does, what does God do? Does God overdo it? Sometimes as parents, we overcorrect, and that's a mistake. And sometimes as parents, we can undercorrect and kind of let things slide that we should really just sit down and talk about. Uh, you know, we go to extremes because we're not perfect, but our Heavenly Father is perfect. Right. And He doesn't overcorrect or undercorrect. He does what's correct. He applies the right amount of pressure. God does exactly what is necessary in our lives. Why? That we might turn to Him and that we might believe Him. That's what He was doing with them and for them. That's what He's doing with us and for us. And, you know, we end today with the invitation we end with every week. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. It's going out not just to northern kingdom, not just to the southern kingdom, right? Not just over there, but this is for us today right now in America and throughout the world. All the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Isaiah 45, 22. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the simplicity of the gospel in Isaiah. We thank you, Lord, for how clear it is that um, you are the foundation of the Christian life. You are the foundation of the Christian church. You are the chief cornerstone by which we measure everything uh, in our lives and in the church and in the family. And, uh, and not only that, Lord, but you are the head and you are the king. You're all of it. You're everything, Alpha and Omega. And so, Lord, help us not to think we are anything, but that you might increase, we might decrease. And when others see us, they won't see uh, Americans. They won't see Baptists. They won't see religion. Lord, by your grace, they'll see Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. There burns a fire with sacred heat, white hot with holy flame. And will not emerge the same. Some as bronze and some as silver, some as gold, yet with great skill. Oh,
I can tell the world my Jesus has saved me by his power he changed me and now I'm whole marvelous the grace and mercy that sought me with his love he bought me and saved my soul and saved my soul wonderful love wonderful love forever i'll tell it in heaven above in heaven above i'll praise his name forever in this world below i'll sing of his glory i'll tell the sweet story how he made me his own he made me his own i can tell the world sweet peace he hath given and his love he hath proven on calvary now i sing the song place and set me free wonderful love wonderful love forever i'll tell it in heaven above in heaven above i'll praise his name forever. in this world below sweet story how he made me his own he made me his own I can tell the world I'm going up yonder no longer to wander in sin and alone to know because of my Savior and his wonderful favor. Heaven is my home, heaven is my home. Wonderful love, wonderful love, forever I'll tell it. In heaven above, in heaven above, I'll praise his name, praise his name. In this world below, I'll sing of his glory, I'll tell the sweet story, how he made me his own, I'll tell the sweet story, how he made me his own, I'll tell the sweet story, how he made me his
shall always be my song of praise, for it was grace that bought my liberty. I do not know just why he came to love me. So
But the best way that I could say it is this. Good morning. It's funny how uh, just before 11 o'clock, I'll sit here kind of quietly and wondering exactly what time it is. It's, uh, it's good to have you w uh, with us this morning. I hope you've had a, a good uh, weekend. Uh, we were blessed here yesterday. Uh, yesterday morning, uh, we had the memorial service um, for our dear sister, uh, Mrs. Hardison. And uh, many of you have been praying for their family for an extended period of time and uh, you know she went into a nursing home a long time ago now and but her heart was strong her lungs were strong her body was strong her mind was not and so she required continual care um, and yet as it was testified many times yesterday if you went to visit her and you began if you started to quote a passage she could finish the passage with you if you started singing any hymn, she could sing the whole thing with you, and uh, and it really was a blessing. You know, I've commented a number of times. At this point in my life, I've been around a number of people who were um, in some way um, restricted in their uh, ability uh, to be themselves in their own minds, if you understand what I'm saying. In other words, they were hindered in their reasoning. And at that point, um, there's a an inability to practice what we would consider to be social graces. In other words, you know, I don't know how you exactly how you feel wherever you're sitting right now, but if you lost the ability to restrict yourself, I would know exactly how everybody was feeling right now because we just say whatever comes to our mind under those circumstances. And it blesses me to see the saints of God under duress um, rejoicing in the goodness of God uh, even when they, when they couldn't do anything other than whatever comes through their heart. And, I, and it is my desire for each and every one of us that, this would, that we wouldn't have to, quote-unquote, behave a certain way, but that it would be really a matter of walking after the Spirit. And so that which would come out of us would be that which our heart was full of, and that that be Christ. Um, looking forward to what the Lord's going to show us uh, today, both this morning and this evening. Um, Brother John, I, for those of you who watched the Sunday School before you came here, uh, did a wonderful job in Isaiah uh, chapter 28, and um, I've been waiting. Uh, if you remember, Isaiah 28 contains um, the whole idea of edifications in it, the whole idea of the cornerstone is in it. Uh, actually, you know the phrase of, with the cornerstone, but we're going to see together tonight, we're going to look into Isaiah 28 in the context of what we're looking at on Sunday mornings together. 
But the Lord is really burdening my heart. If we're going to understand what it means to edify, to be built, to be built up together, it's important that we all enter into this as one. Uh, again, the class on Tuesday night has been just tremendous in helping us to understand that the church is the body of Christ. It's not like the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And that means that it is necessary that we function as one. And the only one that we can function as is Christ himself. You can't be selfish. I can't be selfish. We have to all say, no, no, let's jump into this all together, knowing that Christ is able to so work in each and every one of us individually that we will work together individually but we'll be one. And we'll see that a little bit more together this morning. Um, let's open in a word of prayer. After that, Sean uh, Horrigan's going to come and do the worship reading, which is Psalm 115. So that's what we're going to do. And then after that, Kenny's going to come and lead us in the first song of the song sheets, How Great Thou Art, which has a front and a back to it. But we're going to try this morning something that may be helpful. Uh, we're going to have the words on the screen uh, behind us, because since the choir's not in the loft, we won't be blocking them with the screen. And so, uh, and this will allow the booth to be able to use that uh, online so the people online will be able to see the same thing that we're seeing. We'll just see how that works. Uh, Lord willing, it'll work well. Let's pray. Ask the Lord to bless our time together. Father, just standing here right now, Lord, I am aware that there's only one reason to be in this building, and that is for the church to assemble. Lord, it is your desire that we, your children, would assemble together because Jesus is this. Lord, you've made us new creatures, many, perhaps even the, the majority of the people in the room, maybe even the vast majority of the people that are in the room right now and watching online are really new creatures, are really truly born again. Lord, that's because of what you've done for us. It's because of what you're doing in us that we can look forward. We have this tremendous expectation of good in our lives. Lord, as uh, I believe uh, it might have been Mike, somebody was sharing this morning, um, that in the average person, uh, sorrow is their daily life, and joy is the exception. But in the child of God, joy is the daily life. Sorrow is the exception. Lord, I pray that each and every one of your children would understand the joy unspeakable and full of glory that you want us to be able to enter into, and that we would really wonderfully enter into it together. Lord, we rejoice in how great you are. We rejoice in how good you are. And Lord, we rejoice in your ability to change us, to conform us to the image of Christ. Lord, we realize and recognize that all we have to do is to be honest, humble, and to literally just say to you, we submit, we submit to you. We want you to work mightily in our lives. We thank you that you're doing it, that I get to see it. I'm so glad to be able to see what you're doing in the lives of my brothers and sisters. Lord, we pray for the needs of the Hardison family today. Lord, we pray for the needs of all of the families in our local church today and all of those around us, Lord, in, our, in other local churches, Lord, our missionaries all over the world. Lord, every one of our brothers and sisters in Christ, wherever they are, would you meet the need? And then, Lord, to this world, this lost and dying world, would you send forth those who are walking after the Spirit, walking with you in a way that can be visibly seen, that people might be rescued from themselves. Lord, use your own word and your own Holy Spirit to accomplish these things. We praise you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you'll open to Psalm 115, Psalm 115, Sean will come up and he'll lead us. And then Kenny, you can come after that. Good morning. Good morning. So as I was uh, looking to select a, a reading, looking for uh, kind of the promises of God, and, uh, and this one stood out to me as I was reading through. And uh, verse 12 kind of, kind of sums it up that just in our nation, the Lord has blessed us. Uh, and just you know, short, short history of our country, we've been very blessed. Um, 
However, there's, there is a warning there. And, uh, and as John had mentioned in Sunday school, that the, uh, they said that the Lord will remove the prosperity of any nation that rejects him. And, uh, and so there's danger in, in our nation. And as we focus on the idols, as, as they're called out in the psalm, that we, can, uh, that we can fall out of God's graces and be chastened by him. Um, but again, the promise is there. And as we look over and over in the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, as uh, they continued to fall away and then were chastened and continue to come back to him and receive his blessings again. We have that promise that, that we can continue to receive the blessings of God. If we're Psalm 115. Not unto us, O Lord, not under us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes they have, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them, so is every one that trusteth in them. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord, he is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He that is their help and their shield. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. Ye are blessed of the Lord, which make the heaven and the earth. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right, let's take our song sheet and look at the front and the back of the first uh, page. And we'll sing the... Sweet, sweet, sweet. 
Amen. <laughs> All right, just a few announcements to share with you. Uh, this Tuesday night, 7 p.m., there will be normal Christian life study uh, available on Zoom. And then we'll have our men's meeting Thursday evening, 7 p.m. here at the church. And then Saturday morning, 8 a.m., men's prayer time here at the church. The ladies will also be meeting Thursday, 6, 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. Church office will be open this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 10 to 3. Uh, this Wednesday, 7 p.m., you're welcome to join us in the auditorium as we pray for our nation and pray for uh, the youth ministries and for God to give us direction and His leadership as we go forward. Um, also, we'll have the uh, resources available uh, virtually online as well. The links should be up, up by 7 and uh, uh, resources for uh, children of all ages. Um, also, we're going to have um, a special time for the youth Sunday evenings in October. Um, make plans to join our fun kickoff. We'll be serving dinner each evening. Um, next week, we're going to have on online sign-ups for Sunday evening to have some idea of the number of children that will want to be a part of that. Um, it'll start a little bit earlier than the uh, evening service as we get started with those. We'll have more information about that. Um, October 4th is going to be pizza night, and this is going to be... Uh, we're ministering from kindergarten to 12th grade. Now, we do have a meeting right after the morning service for those of you that already know you're going to be involved in those special services for the kids uh, or you want to be involved. We do have some needs. I know we still need a couple of game leaders for two of the nights. Uh, we're doing two of the nights, and then the Edge is going to do uh, the other two. So we still need some help with uh, games and some other things. So please come to that meeting after the morning service, and we can tell you where the need is. Um, Let's see, mention the, mention the meeting. Uh, the seniors, ladies, Senior Ladies Bible Study will start Tuesday, October 6, 9.30 a.m. at Vicki Smith's house. Um, contact Judy Agner with questions about that. The first Thursday of the month, October 8th, uh, the ladies will continue to meet at April Bradley's house uh, for Ladies Bible Study there as well. And then Saturday, October 5th, is the Harvest Rally this coming Saturday at the Edge Camp. It's for 7th through 12th graders from 9 to 5. It's, uh, if you haven't been, it's like pretty much like a day at the wilds. So uh, let the office know. If you haven't already indicated that your children are planning to attend, please let the office know. Also, there's some availability. The, the Edge Camp has a couples retreat going on this week, Thursday the 1st through Saturday the 3rd. $285 per couple. You can register online for that. There's still some openings. I think Brother Scott Pauly is the speaker. Is that no, right? No. Ah. Amen. Okay. Amen. So that's this coming week, uh, Thursday through Saturday. And then we're having uh, missions, upcoming mission services for our missions conference. We're going to have that in our AM services. So October the 11th, the Benders will be with us from Scotland. October 25th, Scott Carsley from the Edge Camp. November 1st, uh, Stephen Knickerbocker will be in our morning service. And then the 8th, uh, Brent Moody, who ministers at Hampton Roads Regional Jail, will be with us on that Sunday. All right, I believe those are all the announcements. And now we'll have a special in song. I, I'm sorry, now we'll have pastor and prayer for the nation. <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen. It is interesting because, uh, you know, because of the, uh, the way the service has been, has, is going now, in a sense, we have a different order of service, and uh, you don't realize how much you begin in your mind to form a pattern of the way things are done. The older that I get, the more important the pattern is also, and uh, if you get off, if I get off the pattern almost at all on any level, I don't know about the rest of you, but, uh, uh, you know, I could be standing in a field someplace wondering why I'm standing <laughs> in that field, amen? So I'm going to ask Brother, uh, you know, it's... Uh, um, it is wonderful to have the crunks uh, with us, the parents, and, uh, you know, um, we miss them. You know, I, I'm confident that God has them where they're supposed to be, and they're living uh, hours away from us and uh, over near the Spains, and you guys have good fellowship, I'm sure, and a good local church there, but they're visiting right now. And so what we've been doing, Mark, just to let you know why you're about to walk up here, is uh, we uh, just call somebody from the floor each, uh, each Sunday morning to uh, to pray that God would uh, accomplish His will in our nation, that He'd strengthen His churches, and that He would form in our government the leadership that He would have in our nation, and we need His help. So if you would just come up and ask it, our Lord to do that for us, that'd be wonderful.
good to be back. Amen. We love you guys, even though we're not close. You know, it's amazing to think what, how things have gone over the last several months, and each, every, each and every church has struggles, and uh, just amazing. Uh, my biggest fear, and I think the pastor's biggest fear in that is that people who have gone away won't come back. And so we need to pray for those people that they turn. Um, you know, this virus stuff isn't an easy thing to deal with, but uh, the devil has used it for his good and his honor and uh, hurting churches all over the country. So let's, let's pray as, uh, and for our country, for our leaders, for our pastors. You know, you got to show some patience with pastors trying to figure this stuff out. You know, it's not an easy thing to try to, be love your people to the point where you want to protect them and take care of them, but you know you also know you got to meet, you got to have service, you got to you got to have preaching and teaching and singing and all those things. So well, let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you today and we just want to say thank you for what you do for us each and every day, Lord. It's amazing that. Uh, You've allowed us to be born in this country, and there's some folks who weren't born here but have come here and uh, made it their home, and uh, because of the promises and uh, the way our country has done things through the years, and we pray that you'll just bless in all things. Lord, we pray for our leaders. We pray for our president. We pray for Congress. We pray for legislation. We pray for judges. We pray for all those folks who make decisions in this day and time. Lord, but we pray that you'll bind the devil. You'll take and just uh, tie him up and just not let him loose and uh, allow churches to take and get back to where they need to be. Uh, we think about churches where when they're meeting, they know what it's going to come and they're getting fined thousands of dollars right, each right. service and that type of stuff, and it just isn't easy. And, Lord, we pray that you'll work. Lord, we love you. We love that you... Love us so much that right. you gave yourself to take and come to out of heaven's glory and come to this earth and be born in a manger and just, uh, Lord, I just sometimes I wonder why you like you do. Yeah. Lord, we pray that you'll just bless. Pray for our pastors. Pray for our our folks. We pray that you'll just keep everybody well and you'll you'll take and uh, as we come to November third and the voting that people. Uh, will get out and vote what they need to do, what's their right, what's their obligation to take and vote. Right. Lord, we pray that you'll just bless in all things. We pray for Tidewater. We pray for our church at home. We pray for pastors throughout the world today who have preached the gospel already, who will preach the gospel. Lord, and we pray that uh, folks will come to know you. Lord, uh, we we know you don't want anybody to go to hell. We pray for family members that aren't saved. Right. We pray that you'll just somehow, some way, touch their heart, bring yeah. them to you, Lord. Yeah. We don't, you don't want anybody to go to hell, and we don't want any family yeah. members to go to hell, yeah. Lord. And we pray that you'll just work, Lord. We love you and thank you for what you do. We look forward to what you have in in mind for us in this service. We pray that our hearts and minds be attentive to the Holy Spirit. And, Lord, that the pastor will give us the words. We, you'll give the pastor the words that yeah. we need to take and uh, apply as we go home, not just hear it, but apply it to our life as yeah. we go. Lord, we love you, and thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 This time I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, we'll be reading verses 1 through 16. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But, speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ." from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. And now we'll have that special in song. (laughs) There he is. All right. Amen. So those of you that know me don't know I don't normally talk before I sing because I'm too nervous, but uh, this song I haven't sang in a lot of years, um, but I I had the uh, privilege of being at uh, Mrs. Hardison's funeral yesterday um, and listening to the comments being made uh, as far as her life being a a testimony for Christ um, and, and being a witness, and it really brought this song to mind. Um, the song is called Trophy of Grace, but the the interesting thing about the trophy is it's literally just a symbol of the accomplishments of the one that won or earned the trophy. Um, and this this song is really, uh, it's a really neat song because it, it talks about we as Christians are a trophy of God's grace. We're a symbol, a representation of his accomplishments and his victory. Um, and so, again, like I said, I haven't sang this one years, so you all just have to be uh, gracious to me. So. <laughs> If you had known me then The way I was before You would understand Why I can't hold back the tears For my life Since I gave it to the Lord And I want to give Him glory While I'm here I stand before you knowing It's only by His grace that I am just what I am today. I'm a trophy of grace, a display of His love. I'm part of the results from the old rugged cross. 
cross that was stained with his precious blood. Though I'll never understand why he died in my place. Just look at me today. All I can say is I'm a trophy of grace Now there is no way I can repay his love and the mercy shown is more than life to me there is nothing I can do or say that would be enough to pay the debt of sin he paid for me So let my life be a testimony of His mercy, love, and grace. And someday I will thank Him face to face. I'm a trophy of grace. A display of His love. I'm part of the results from the old rugged cross that was stained with His precious blood. Though I'll never understand why He died in my place. Look at me Today, all I can say, I'm a trophy of grace. When you look at me today, all I can say is I'm a trophy of grace. Amen. <sighs> <sighs> Amen. I don't know if that song originated with the uh, Victorious Valley Girls or not, but that's where I first heard it. And, um. You know, the Bible says those that have been forgiven much uh, love much. I think sometimes Christians, their love is lukewarm because they don't know how much they've been forgiven. Some of us, you know, um, were rescued from terrible, terrible, selfish lives. All of us were, but some of us it was more obvious to others. And so... I hope that where you're sitting this morning, that uh, as we spend this time together this morning, you'll begin to realize the purpose, the purpose of being here as a trophy of grace, uh, that we are here to be a display of his goodness, of his love, of his glory. That is why we're here. As soon as we were saved, we were fit for heaven. So we could have just left. He could have saved us and taken us. In the same way that he said to the thief on the cross, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He could have taken us. We could have got saved, gone, just like that. And that would have been, by the way, wonderful <laughs> for all of us. But to be here is needful. There's purpose in us being here. But your purpose in being here, you know, I can, if you say, why am I here as a Christian? I, it doesn't matter which one of you would ask me this question. The answer is to show forth the goodness and the glory and the power of God 
That's why you're here. You are, you are not here. You know, one of the things that I'm becoming more and more wonderfully aware of is that God is truly not glorified in your doing things for him. He is glorified in you allowing him to do things through you. And there's all the difference in the world between those two things. Cain wanted to do things for God. And God said, Cain, you can't approach, you can't come here like that. But Abel came by the blood. And he didn't, how much could he really truly understand coming by the blood at that point? He knew that, that God had shed blood to cover his mom and dad. And he knew that the blood, therefore, was important. And he recognized that his only approach was that somebody else was going to make him worthy of being able to come to God. He was looking forward to that old rugged cross that we are looking back to. But it's the same blood. From beginning to end, it's the same blood. There's only one blood. Only one blood that matters. And it is the precious blood. Amen. We saw this together yesterday at the funeral. There's only one precious blood. And it's the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've got the blood... You've got the Son, and if you've got the Son, you've got life. And if you have not the Son of God, then you have not life. You can have church and not have life. You can have all kinds of religion and not have life. But if you've got the Son, S-O-N, then you've got life. Amen? Okay, so uh, if you want to open your Bible uh, with me, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. If you want to open your Bible to Acts chapter 9. <laughs> I mentioned uh, a few weeks ago uh, that as, the, as 2019 was coming to an end and 2020 was approaching, the Lord burdened my heart, as I'm sure he did many people, uh, that he wanted to uh, get a hold of my personal vision. Now, as somebody who suffers from retinal dystrophy, which simply means that my eyes don't work correctly and they're getting progressively worse, and eventually the prognosis is supposed to be that I'm supposed to be blind, uh, I'm aware that I don't see well. I know that I don't see well. In fact, I, I have learned to live with how my sight actually is. And if I saw it normally for a second, I'd probably go, oh, wow, that's really great. Good for you guys, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, but what I realize is God is not so interested in my physical sight as he is my spiritual sight that I would see, that you would see as God sees. That you'd see the, everything, everything. That you'd see your daily life, that you'd see yourself, that you'd see him, that you'd see the world around you as God sees. Anyway, so 2020, 2020, right? 2020 vision. Uh, the Lord just burdened me about a 2020 vision. That was to see and be involved in the way that we should, that our local church would have a vision, God's vision, for what it is that he would have us to be involved in. And immediately, as I mentioned before, I was very, very sick at the end of 2019, and it went all the way into February of 2020. And then in March of 2020, um, the coronavirus started. So basically, I didn't look at this at all with you guys. I had in mind already that, that God wanted to um, have us to understand together the three portions of the ministry of every church, and that they are edification, or growing, building up, being strengthened, evangelism, which is to take the gospel into all the world, and exhortation, or encouragement, basically the rescuing of things that are weak or lost, in other words, those that can be met and restored and brought back into going back into edification again so that they might be involved in evangelism, so that we might together accomplish the go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples, which is the idea of building up and being strong together. So this is, the Lord encouraged me that this is what he wanted me to do, but it's now September before we started. And what I've come to, and again, I really thought there were going to be three messages, one on 
edification, one on evangelism, and one on uh, ed, uh, exhortation, and that's not what's happened. And, it's, and I'm confident that what we're going, I really am confident that God wants all of us to understand that for Tidewater to be the, the church that he wants her to be, that it's going to require that you say yes to being involved in the edification of this church. And we're going to see together that it is not an individual thing. It's not the pastor or staff or pastor and deacons. That's not what it is. It's the body all working together. And we'll see this biblically. Of course, the passage that John just read in Ephesians does make that very, very clear. But what we, what we realized is, or what I realized is, in order for us to look at being edified together, we must first understand that, uh, and this is in, I'm not going to ask you to turn there. I'm going to, I am going to read the passage, though. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, you can put this in your notes if you want to. We, we looked at it a couple weeks ago. Matthew 16, 13, and you can turn there if you want to. Just keep your ribbon here in Acts chapter uh, 9, where we're going to come back to. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, and some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. I'm going to stop here for, for just a moment again. Does anybody know how Peter came to meet Jesus of Nazareth? Does anybody know? How did Peter come to meet Jesus of Nazareth? How did Simon come to see, come to meet Jesus of Nazareth? Andrew, right? You can go to the book of John, and Andrew is one of the, one of the original followers. In other words, he's one that hears, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And he goes and he follows. And he goes and he realizes, this is the Christ. And he goes to get his brother. And so when I remember the first time I was reading this and understood what it was that I was reading, and I realized, well, that's not true. Literally, his own actual flesh and blood, his blood brother had revealed to him that Jesus was the Christ. But then I realized, oh, oh, you and I can only point. Do you understand? You and I can only point. You know, Mark was praying for unsaved loved ones. We have flesh and blood that we cannot lead to salvation, but we can lead them to Christ. We can point, but until they meet him, until God the Father, until they humble themselves, and here's the truth, if they will humble themselves, God the Father will reveal to them that Jesus is the Christ. That's all it's going to require, is that they will humble themselves, that they will repent and ask, and God will rescue them. That's all it will require. God is not willing that any should perish. It is his desire, his heart's desire, is that everyone that you know and love, he knows better than you do, and loves more than you do, and he doesn't want them to be lost at all. All that's, now so, so what can we do? And the answer is we can do what Andrew did. And we can say this, come, look for yourself. You understand? It doesn't, it, listen, they do not need you to tell them what's wrong with them. They do not need you to go to them and tell them how great you are. They don't need any of that. Come, look for yourself, but come look in the right place. Come and meet Jesus. Now, you know, you should be able to invite your friends to come here because here should be a place where they should hear, look at Jesus. And you should be confident that any single Sunday they should come, be able to come here and that they should not just hear from the pulpit, but see from the body, see from the membership that Jesus is who he says he is. But notice that it says, you're blessed. Man, I'll tell you what, you know, that song, I mean, I really thoroughly was blessed by that song. Uh, you know, I was waiting for, you know, one of the things about having Mark in the house is there's a chance he could get up and run at any moment, you know what I'm saying? And so I was kind of waiting, I you know, you know, I am a lot 
more composed um, as your pastor than I would be as a member. But I sure wish you guys would lose your composure a little bit. <laughs> really, and I mean that. I really wish that your wagon would get loose. I really do. You know, it's, you do realize that praise God is okay with God. You don't understand that. I believe it's okay for you to stand up and say praise God. I believe it's okay to raise your hands a little bit, okay? I don't believe it's okay to bop people in the forehead and roll around on the floor like a moron. But I do believe that God would have us to truly rejoice in how great our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you really truly recognize as you were hearing the song being sung, thinking, I am a trophy of grace, right? I'm just a trophy of grace. I mean, I've done nothing. Surely I've done, you know, I've, I've, I'm really beginning to enter in more and more and more to what it is that God wants uh, us to enter into. And the more I enter into it, the one, the more I realize how is it possible that it took me this long to enter into it. And two, I, I feel less and less um, worthy of standing up here and doing what I'm doing right now. Because I believe you need to hear what I am saying, but I truly don't believe that I should be the one to say it. And I mean, and that's not, that's not no false humility. I would gladly Let's let John come up and, and preach the morning service week after week after week. I just want you to hear how great Jesus is. I just want you to understand that after he says, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, he says to him, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, and again, we've already looked at the fact that Peter, I do, Peter literally means rock, so you can't say Peter isn't the rock, okay? Peter is a rock. He is. First Peter makes it clear to us that he is a rock. You can even say he's the, going back to what John was saying in Sunday school, you could even say that Peter's the first rock, but he's not the cornerstone, and he's not the foundation. Okay? What matters is, what is your foundation? We looked at this. We don't have time to look at this again. But if Christ is not your foundation, your house will fall down. And then John made a reference, you know, come back this evening, we're going to look, I, I told John, I said, I, I know he's not offended at us at all, I said, I've been waiting for you to get to Isaiah chapter 28, because there's some things in Isaiah chapter 28 that tie into what we're looking at, and so this evening, if you come back together this evening, we're going to look at the building and the fruit from Isaiah 28, and how it fits in with what we're looking at together on Sunday morning. And what you realize is, as he pointed out this, this morning in the Sunday school class, in the same, it talks about the cornerstone, it talks about the lines and the plummet. And I almost thought about having a carpenter come up here and explain to you what the, what the line and the plummet mean. Maybe, I, I still may do that this evening. So those of you that understand carpentry, stand by. You, maybe you should bring a level with you this evening. And a plumb, if you want to bring a plumb line, bring both of those things with you. And I'll have you come up and display it. Because all of those things are, oh, listen, the plumb line and the, and, and the level are only, only valuable if you have something to measure them off of. And Christ is the something to measure them off of. So not only must your life be on Christ, as you grow, as we grow, the only measurement of our growth being accurate is to go back to the cornerstone over and over and over again. That our line be shot back to the cornerstone and say, are we we're supposed to? Because here's the thing. If our church is not growing like it's supposed to, because it's not built level and square to the cornerstone, then it will collapse. Now, here's the good news. The foundation won't be destroyed, right? Again, our church literally burned down. And you know what was left? The foundation. The foundation was not destroyed because the foundation is a good foundation. And Christ is the only foundation that matters. Anyway, he, but here's the thing. I'm really missing getting any, way, any closer to being done in this, uh, this morning. He says, I will build my church. Look at verse 18. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, again, Peter is a rock, he is not the foundation. He's not the cornerstone, but he is important. He is going to preach at Pentecost. I do believe that what you're going to see at, the, at Pentecost is Christ is going to begin building his church. I will build my church. All right. We're learning this on Tuesday night in the normal Christian life. He does not say, I will build my individual free agent for Jesus running around doing whatever they want to do. That is not what he says. He says, I will build my church. We together are the church. We together are the church. Here's, I, I, I have known this for a long time. I've known that selfishness, specifically selfishness in the ministry, was unattractive. 
and somewhat unprofitable. But what I've come to realize now is this. It's devilish. It's devilish. Me, me, me is Satan talk. There's no excuse for it. And we can't have it anymore. It's not about me. Again, when you see the ye and understand it's not the often. In other words, Christ is talking to us collectively together. And it matters to us when he says, I will build my church. What he's saying, and this is the miracle. This is the miracle. And it really is a miracle. I'm just, James, I'm going to move. I just want to let you know I'm going to move. Okay. We've given James new cameras. Um, and still when I move, it's still hard for him. So I just take Chris and Mitch. I don't know what Chris and Mitch have in common. I do know what Chris and I have in common, and it's not a I know what Mitch and I have in common, and it's not a great number of things, but I do know what we have in common is Christ. And I know that. I mean, Chris is really a new creature, and Mitch is really a new creature. And so we get along wonderfully well because he loves Jesus, and he loves Jesus, and I love Jesus, and he doesn't want to do anything that Jesus doesn't want him to do, and he doesn't want to do anything that Jesus doesn't want him to do, and I don't want to do anything that Jesus doesn't want me to do. And so we can extend that, right? We can extend that and go, in the, in the pews that they're sitting in, we can extend that because that's true, and that's true, and that's true, and that's true, and that's wonderful. And we should need to be able to extend it all the way through all of the pews, right? And every single pew, all the way through all the pews, we need to be able to say this, Christ will build his church, and we are his church, and I'm just part. I'm one rock in the, in the found, in, in, on the foundation of Christ, built together, or I'm one member of the body, and I have to do my part, right? Now again, I know this is brought up a lot, but how many of you are at the age now, where, how many of you, when you get, anybody, when you get up, does your back, if you do anything, bent over. <laughs> I was doing something the other day, bent over, and I went to stand up. And my back said it, this is basically how my back said it, not so fast. Not so, it wasn't that I couldn't stand up, I just couldn't stand up quickly. And, and it, now anybody else want to raise their hand for that? Wow, that's a lot of us. We're in trouble. So, <laughs> all right. Here's the good news. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, <laughs> brand new, amen? We're going to get a new body. But here's the thing. We're aware of how a injured or weak body affects our ability to do things. My eye, and again, please don't feel, I'm not saying this to feel you feel, but my eyes are so bad, if I can't hold something here, I can't work on it anymore. I can't work, I can't even see that. Even if I try to turn my head and look at it, I can't see it right, unless I can turn my head and actually get in front of it like this. I can't see. I really, I can't see much at all anymore. Things around the house, I can't, you know, if Kathy says this is not working, you, it, it takes so much for me to just, just to be able to look at something. Again, the, the dishwasher is not working correctly. I can't look at the dishwasher because I can't, there, there's, I mean, the dishwasher is too heavy for me to hold it up and turn it around like it's a cube and figure out what's wrong with it. Do you understand? I can't put my head inside the dishwasher and look around because I can only see one thing at a time as I look around and I don't know what I'm looking for. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's how bad my eyes are. My body is greatly hindered because of how bad my eyes are. How bad is, is the church hindered because of how weak the members are? And then the question is, now listen, if you're sat here and thought, yeah, our church sure would be better if, if he did a better job, then you have no idea what's going on. Because that wasn't for him. It was for you. Do you understand? It's not how weak you are. It's how weak I am that hinders our church. I have to say yes to Christ. I, you have to say yes to Christ. But here's the thing. What we have to be able to recognize is if I say yes to Christ and you say yes to Christ, we have nothing to brag about because that was our reasonable service. And here's the thing, in the context of that verse, it doesn't say the, it's your reasonable service individually. It's say, it, what, the, what Romans chapter 12 is saying is it's our reasonable service that we would all say together, again, this is the only way I can picture it, let's hold hands and jump and let Jesus do what he'll do. Let's recognize, you say, but this is dangerous. It's dangerous by faith to leap into all the will of God together. What if it can't be done? It can't be done. But Jesus can do it. 
And he's looking for a group of people who will say, not me, not me, you, but you and all of us together. This is a miracle. This is the miracle. The miracle is not watch Mitch grow. It is a miracle to watch Mitch grow. It is. It is wonderful to watch each and every one of us grow individually, but God is not glorified in your individual growth. And if you, this is what makes, this is what makes a lot of churches unpleasant because the people that are in it are getting theirs. You understand? They're there to get theirs. They're, I chose this church because I need this church or my family needs this church. No, this church needs your family. You understand? Do you understand the difference between consumer and bearer? Anybody understand the difference? So if you're a consumer, right, the church brings forth fruit, and you're a consumer of fruit, and you, this, this is what's wrong with socialism. I'm not going to get political. It's wrong with socialism, communism, right? We take somebody else's, and we distribute it. Oh, well, eventually you run out of that. You understand that? Eventually you run out of that. So here's the thing. If, and again, I'm just going to go back to Mitch and Chris. So if Chris Cromwell comes for the Cromwell family to get theirs, what are they contributing? Where am I going to get mine? Do you understand? Each and every one of us, every joint fitly supplying, every one of us involved in the work of Christ, doing what it is. That, and who's building the whole thing? Christ. Right? What's the promise? I will Build my church. Praise God. You want to be involved in that? Honestly, I mean that. You say, well, I, I joined the church a long, long time ago. Me too. I joined this church, as a matter of fact, long, as far as I know, 20-something years ago, 21 years ago, I joined this church. And here's what I've come to realize. I don't know how much I've understood the whole being a part of the body. Now, I'm a local church advocate. If you're in a local church, what that means is I believe in the local church. But I don't know if I've really entered in just to how important it is that it's not about, can I get two or three people to help out in the ministry a little bit? That is not what the local church is. The local church is every one of us. Okay, let me ask you this. And I know, I, I, I don't do this a lot. If you really think you're born again, I really believe that I'm born again. I really believe my sins are forgiven. I really believe that I'm a new creature. Would you stand up? Stand up if you really think that's true for you. Now, I don't know how many of you had to stand up because you were ashamed not to. But if you stood up and you know in your heart that you're lying, then you need to get saved because you're not a new creature. If you stood up to stand up, then you need to be saved. But if you stood up because you are saved, because you really are a new creature, then praise God. Now, I want you to look around. We have a few visitors with us, but I just everybody look around. Everybody look around. This is the body. Now, this is about half the body, right? Because we're constrained in how many people we can have. You have to sign up for the church on Sunday morning. It's about half the body. So that down if you would. All of us have to work together. So we're talking about uh, doing a ministry on Sunday night. Doing a ministry on Sunday night. For the, for, the, for, the teen, for the kids. For the children that we would normally bring in the vans. Right? Who's going to be involved in that? Who's going to be, now listen. Here's Who's going to actually physically be out in the field involved in it? And the answer is, I don't know. But who's going to be involved in it? And the answer is, all of us. All of us. Yes? You understand? The nursing home ministry. Who's involved in the nursing home ministry? Not who goes over to the nursing home. Who's involved in the nursing home ministry? And the answer is, all of us. All of us. Every ministry of the local church, all that's going on in the local church, it's all the body being Together, doing what God would have us to do. It's really important. Listen, I mean this with all my heart. If you're here at Tidewater the same way you chose your phone plan, then just go someplace else. Because we don't need consumers. You say, oh no, but if you saw my tithe, you'd want me to stay. No, I wouldn't. Because that's not the strength of the church. Our finances are wonderful. Praise God for that. But that's not the strength of the church. The strength of the church is how many people are saying yes to Jesus Christ and humbling themselves and saying, it's not about me, it's about him, but it's about him working in all of us together right here, amen? And here's the thing, once we mature to really understanding that, we're going to stop thinking it's about our local church at all. And we're going to start realizing, oh, it's about not just our local church, I mean, Jesus is the head of that church, and Jesus is the head of that church, and Jesus is the head of that church. We should be able to work together. Do you understand that? Amen? Yes or no? Do you understand what God is really wanting to accomplish? Is that a miracle or not? 
Do you understand? Do you want to know? Listen, um, do you want to know what the, uh, uh, what's it called? Veterans of VFW, right? Veterans of Foreign War. Is that right, VFW? Okay. Do you want to know what they have in common? Do you want to know what that they have in common? They're all veterans of foreign wars. That's how they get to be in the club. But listen to me. The church is not like that. The church takes everybody. 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 Everybody that calls upon the Lord Jesus Christ is part of the church. Everybody. Everybody. There are no groups in the local church. There are no groups in the church. We have to understand that. Now, I do understand. When I first got saved, I was so excited until I realized a lot of people that went to church weren't Christians. A lot of places that were called churches weren't churches. I mean, it was hard. Visited a lot of places and thought, that's not even the gospel. You, I don't know what y'all are doing here, but y'all to quit. I just close this thing down. And again, I wasn't being unkind. I was, too, I was too, too young to be unkind. All I wanted to do was to find a place where I could hear the truth being preached in love, by the way. Anybody ever visit a church where they're right about everything and they'll fight you to prove it? Well, that's just not Jesus. That's not who he is. Do you understand? This is what God wants to do in our church. I haven't even got, I'm, I'm on page one. I got six pages of notes. And I, and I you know, I, I'm not trying, I am so, you know, I think it's, I really do believe, <clears throat> I want you to be able to re rejoice and I'm a trophy of grace. But I want you to care about the people who aren't. Because that's why we're here. That's what, does Jesus care? Does Jesus want to make all of us more wonderful trophies of grace? Whose trophies is it anyway? By Who holds the trophy? Right? If I'm a trophy of grace, who holds the trophy? Jesus does. Amen? You know, the Bible's really clear that there's a coming a day when there will be a, uh, a uh, rewards, a day of rewards at, the, at the, what's called the, the Bema Seat of Christ, the Judgment Seat of Christ for the believers. There will be a, Chris Cromwell, come here. Let me give you the crowns that you actually earned when you were on the earth. And he will have earned some crowns. And you will, if you're born again, you will have earned some crowns. And I will have earned some crowns. And the Bible seems to be really clear about where all those crowns end up after we get them. And they all end up at his feet. We just throw them at his feet. Why? Because I didn't do anything that you didn't do through me. Well, that's not true. I did a lot of things that you didn't do through me. And they're burning up over there in that pile. Right? Is that what it says? Right? It says, he says, first he says, you're going to take all of your things you've done, all of your works, they'll all be collected together, and then he's going to take the match of motives and throw it on the pile, and the wood, hay, and stubble are going to burn up. And whatever remains, that is your reward. And you'll receive it in crowns. And, I'm, and here's the thing. How many of you are aware that the pile is going to look, be a lot bigger before the match than after the match? Anybody want to raise their hand to that one? I literally, I know I've said this before, but I literally remember years ago now, 20 years ago probably, maybe, maybe more than 20 years ago, sitting in a class uh, studying 1 Corinthians and realizing when the match of motives was being discussed, and I literally was sitting in class, I was still working as an engineer for Northrop Grumman, and I was crying. And I wasn't crying loudly, I didn't even realize I was crying, I was just sitting there crying. And the professor stopped the class, he said, Mr. Pearson, are you okay? And I said, I'm not okay. I said, I just got to look at my pile when it's on fire. And I'm telling you, if you're being selfish, your pile is still on fire. Until you humble yourself. Listen, the same humility that saved us is the humility that will grow us. And the same humility that grows us is the humility that will bring forth fruit unto eternal life. And there will be crowns for that. And then when you receive that, and you'll be, I don't know if you'll be, I really don't know, I don't know, I don't know, we won't be proud when we receive our crowns. There'll be no pride in it. We may be thankful, we may be grateful, we may be like, wow, I didn't think there were going to be two, you know what I'm saying? You know, I, I was confident there was going to be one because I'm here, but I didn't know there'd be two. And then when you get them, and I don't know how, they, I don't know if there's going to be a ceremony. Okay, everybody now take the crowns and put them where you think they actually belong, right to his feet. Because we'll all know. We'll all know. And we'll all, and we'll sing what? Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy. Not Charles Spurgeon is worthy. 
Not Hudson Taylor is worthy. Not Paul is worthy. Not David is worthy. Thou art worthy. By the way, guess who will be singing? Paul, David, Hudson Taylor, Amy Carmichael. They'll all be singing. You know what they'll all be singing? Thou art worthy. You want to know why? Because he's worthy. And that's what I want you young people to know. I don't know what your home life is like. I see your parents now. And here's what I want you to understand. If everything's not the way it should be at your house, then pray for your family. Pray for your parents. But everything is like it should be in Jesus. You understand that? I am not the example. Your mom and dad are not the example. Jesus is the example. Right? They're not the cornerstone. They're just a rock in the building. Amen? Each and every one of us are flawed, 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 flawed. But we are his workmanship, and he's making a big difference in our lives. Again, I mean, if you had known me then, that's how that song starts, I believe, right? If you had known me then, man, if you guys had known me then, you would have never voted me in as pastor. You would have never voted me in as pastor. You would have said, that guy, I mean, I mean, yeah, he seems like he's changed, but that guy can't be a pastor. Well, Paul was a murderer, and he was an apostle. But for all of his life, he was aware that he was still a murderer, right? He was not worthy to be an apostle, and he was not worthy, but neither was Peter worthy to be an apostle. Neither was James. Even John, who's the beloved disciple, is not worthy of being an apostle. Nevertheless, they're not worthy to be Christ, but Christ is worthy. And that's what I want you to know. So this, is, this was not the message. This is the message this morning. This was not the message. This is not my notes. It is apparently the message for this morning. I hope I really... We're supposed to be in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, by the way, is the first... We're not going to go there now. Uh, It is the first mention of the word edify. It's the church being edified. And by the way, it's the churches, plural, being edified. And Lord willing, we'll see it next week. Come back tonight. Please, come back tonight. If you haven't signed up, I don't know if there's space. Is there any space left for tonight? Probably a little bit. So if you want to come tonight, sign up. See my wife on the way out. See her first. Meet her right here. Say, I want to come back tonight. Come back tonight, and we're going to look at, at, at Isaiah chapter uh, 28, and we're going to look at the building and the fruit. Boy, I tell you, fruit that remains. That's why we're here. Fruit that remains. Right? By the way, we're going to see this tonight. Fruit more fruit, much fruit. And by the way, the difference between fruit and more fruit is some pruning. And the difference between more fruit and much fruit is some more pruning. Yeah, that's why we don't bring forth much fruit. <laughs> because we smack on those pruning shears. No, Lord, no, no. I like that part of my life. And he says, yeah, but it's not bringing forth fruit. And so I'm going to cut it off. And by the way, here's what happens in your life. Well, I'm kind of preaching tonight's message. <clears throat> if you say to God, no, you're not, you know what happens? He doesn't. And you suffer as a result of it. And guess what? You're not the only one that suffers as a result of it. Your children, your coworkers, your neighbors, everybody suffers when you smack on God when he's trying to read out and hand the, get the pruning shears over there and get rid of some things in your life. Everybody wants the dead branches to go. But we've got things in our life that are leafy green that are not fruit. And we don't want those to go. We'll talk about that more tonight. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us this time together. Thank you, Lord, for the reading for Psalm 115. Thank you for the truth contained in Psalm 115. And thank you for um, Sean being willing to stand up here and read it to us. Lord, thank you for the the, uh, songs that we already have heard, the one that we sang together and the one that you had Andy sing. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for the prayer, Lord, that we've already had. Lord, thank you for Mark being willing to come up just on the spur of the moment and pray, Lord, that you'd be glorified and that your churches would be strengthened. Lord, and I know that that's your desire, that you would be glorified and you will be. And your churches will be strengthened. All we have to do is humble ourselves and say yes to you and you will strengthen us. Now, Lord, as we sing this last song of, the, of this, our time together this morning, which I believe is take the name of Jesus with you. I'm not sure if that's it or not. Um, but whatever it is, may, it be, may you be glorified. And may we really, really think about what we're doing with our lives. We thank you. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now remember, immediately following uh, the morning service, there's a meeting in the large classroom, John. Yes. Meeting. Oh, yes.
Mike, Mike, face painting, brother. You got, what, a four-inch brush? You can do the whole paint. You can do the whole face at one stroke, brother. What color would you want? <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Amen. Amen. All right. So take your sheets of paper. And uh, hey, does anybody, did anybody read the words on the screen when we did the last song? Is that working for okay for some people? Yeah? We may keep doing it then. We may keep doing it. All right. Kenny, come on. Take the name of Jesus with you. It's a good one. To it is to end this. Yeah, amen. Amen. Is it saying? Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where you go. Precious name, oh how sweet. Oh, and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. I need to uh, meet with uh, Chris for, for a minute and uh, Simon for just a minute. Simon, why don't you come over here? I'm going to ask you to close us in prayer this morning if you would anyway. And then so if the two of you would just stay up here afterwards and we'll talk for a second, okay? Right. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, this beautiful day, Lord, this chance to come together and worship you um, as a body, Lord. And thank you for the message and the encouragement, Lord. And uh, Help us, Lord, to focus on you um, and to always keep our eyes on the cornerstone and um, and to just let you use us, Lord, to build the church and uh, be part of uh, your purposes here on earth, Lord. Yeah. I mean, we just praise you for um, the songs that we sang today and the message that we heard. And we ask us that you would bless us today and bring us back tonight and uh, help us to come with our hearts prepared to hear the word again. Yeah. In your name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you. Ushers, if you'd help everybody be dismissed. Thanks, guys. See you tonight.